Welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Mike DeHaan and Dan Austin. From wins, losses, horror stories, and tactics for optimizing your business, Mike and Dan take a real, uncensored deep dive into the ins and outs of running a full-time real estate investment and wholesaling business. What is going on, guys? Welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast, Mike and Dan Show, where myself, Mike DeHaan, and my co-host, Dan Austin, talk real estate, business, investing, and whatever the hell else we feel like because it's our show. Um, (laughs) Say whatever we want. (laughs) We say whatever we want. Within reason. Within reason. I know we got to make sure you don't get canceled, Dan, but that's your business. Um, But this is our first recording, I would say, after a full week into the new year where all of the sellers have come out and said, new year, new me, please take my property. So money. if you guys are, give me give money. Me money. So if you guys are new, junkie property. Exactly. If you guys are new to the show, Dan and I, we run a real estate wholesaling investing business. We do it for ourselves here in a local market. We have a bunch of partners all around the country where we are jointly helping them buy properties. We have a group coaching program. And within our own business, we had... Well, it looks to be like honestly, maybe our one of our biggest weeks that we've ever had. That seemed, and maybe it just feels that way because it seemed to come from nothing. But like we had the deadest of dead December's, where like all of our staff was like, "Eh, I'm gonna, we're gonna quit." <laughs> like maybe, like yeah, when there's no money anywhere, and then January turns over, and like literally all the sellers were like, "New year, new me." I'm going to offload all these properties. Raising, and it was like, hands. they were raising hands, dude, ready to go. Like, let's park. It was board. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It was be- between like Wednesday and Friday. I think we, we signed everything. We had 10 deals that got signed around and yeah. put into escrow. We definitely had more in escrow at the same time, but like to have it all happen that quick. Cause I think we have like 14 in escrow right now. Is what, mm-hmm. I, what I checked last. Um, like, I think, I think we're up to, we're up to 15. Cause we got another one yesterday. No, at 14. Cause we were at less. And then we got another one yesterday. Um, but uh, it is off to a crazy start, man. Yep. And not only that, but like a lot of the sellers that we've been continuing to build relationships with over the holidays, as you're supposed to, have started to have more constructive conversations, you know, and like a lot of them are realizing that just because the new year turns over doesn't mean that the property that they have been holding on to with a sort of sunk cost bias is going to suddenly be better. Yeah. Nothing changes with the date. (laughs) The year 2022, 2023, your house still sucks or it still has the problems or you're still in debt, whatever it is. Yeah. Well, and not only that, but a lot of people that had time sensitive issues, you know, because like the government was trying to seize back their property or lenders were trying to steal their property. All that stuff turns over in the new year and they were able to be like, oh, everyone's at Christmas. I haven't heard from the bank for, you know, six months. Not six months. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because like literally we had a deal yesterday that, um, you know, our, our sales guy, James, did a, did a killer job on this. He followed up with the guy because the guy had already signed with somebody else, was supposed to close yesterday. Um, James followed up with them and was like, hey, how'd that closing go? And the guy's like, oh, yeah, it fell through. I'm losing the house tomorrow. I'm getting foreclosed on. Oh. And we were like, what? Well, we still want to buy it. Yeah. You know, so jumped on, got our contact that's on the ground out in that market out there to figure out the details. Basically, we just have to pay like 5,400 bucks to pay off this dude's taxes. And then in exchange, we're like, yeah, we'll do this and we're going to get a sick deal. We're buying his house at a nice discount. A really good deal. So was the guy just doing like an MLS like listing? There was another wholesaler involved. (laughs) It was another investor that couldn't pull their shit together. Oh, really? So we had some competition. We haven't had a lot of competition over there. I I know. It's been been pretty rare in in that particular market, but... Um, I'm not going to say what it is because it's our rare market. It's our rare discover. market. It's our little <laughs> diamond in the rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, like it, the fact that it was another investor was really interesting and, the, and they couldn't get it together. This is one of the areas too that it's important to have more exit strategies because like at the price that we're at, honestly, for a wholesale deal, it would be kind of tough. But when you're prepared to actually close on places and list them and, you know, do more than just strictly wholesale and assignments, it creates a lot more opportunity. And that's exactly what we're doing with this property. Like it's not like a typical fix and flip property, but it'd be very desirable to a homeowner. For sure. 
And it doesn't you know? need a ton of work, it sounds like. It doesn't need, yeah, it doesn't need a ton, ton of work. Um, and, I mean, the, basically it was like an extra house that this guy like inherited or something. And he was looking at selling it for like an easy sale um, because there's like a couple negligent issues on it, but nothing crazy. Mm-hmm. So we still got it and we're just going to go and list it. And I think top line should make 50 to 60 grand. Um, great deal. It's a great deal. Certainly a great deal for just literally doing a... 10 cent follow-up call. I don't even know if, exactly. know if the follow-up call cost 10 cents. It was a free follow-up call. Like, yeah, I mean, just do it. Just follow up. Just because they said they're going to close or they've got a sale locked in does not mean that they do. And I love that strategy of just putting a follow-up date. And if they did sell, it's like, hey, congratulations. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and then that's a, such, that's the main learning experience. I think there is so many people, I mean, we've been through the same sort of zone as well of like, oh, I signed with somebody else in the other direction. They just put it in their dead category of their CRM and they never follow up with them. But right. we know as, you know, better than most people, I would say that there's deals all the time, especially with like in the, in the wholesale world where there's so many amateurs out there who don't know what they're doing. They'll go and they'll sign a deal. They don't have an exit strategy in place. Yeah. They didn't know how to price it appropriately. They drag the seller out for two months and get the seller all pissed off. And then their tactic is to go and try to price drop the seller like 50 grand on like the day before closing because they, they, you know, think that they're going to be able to find someone at that price now. But realistically, if you go in and you follow up with those people on the time that they told you and you're like, Hey, did this work? And they say, no, you're going to, and you can show that you have your shit together a little bit better. You're going to do very well for yourself. And we have done, I don't know, probably seven or eight deals like that over the past couple of years. I think so. Yeah, probably. I'm trying to, I'm trying to add them up in my head and think of which ones would be like a great example of that. Well, I mean, like one of the ones that we bought, we have an Airbnb here in um, in Spokane, which is our main market, and like that was literally the situation. Was yeah, the, yeah, that is a good example. You know, the the seller was um, moving forward with somebody else, and it's funny they actually called us after their other deal fell through. Um, well, sorry, no, they called us because they were nervous about the other person because they were getting a little wishy washy. I wonder why they were nervous about him. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's someone that does have a bad reputation here in town. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't really think much of it at the time. And then we had a lead manager who actually like remembered that conversation, like the seller calling saying like, Hey, you know, I'm not sure if you're, you know, interested in this property, blah, blah, blah. And I remember, I literally remember the notes being like already under contract with somebody else, just like exploring options. And then it just sat for like two weeks. And then our lead manager was like, whatever happened to, I think her name was Jamie, to Jamie. Was, yeah. yeah, and he went and just like called her on, on, you know, on a whim. And like literally she was like, oh yeah, I actually canceled that contract with them today. Do you guys want to buy it? And we were like, sure. And she was like, this is what they originally offered me. And then they tried to drop me down like 40,000. I was like, big quick math. I'm like, well, we can pay that original price. Like yeah, it's a pretty it wasn't sweet a bad house. Price for, yeah, for a turnkey pretty much. We did a little bit of work too, but. A little bit, yeah. Hard but based turn. Yeah, turnkey Airbnb, and you know it's an old house. It's a little bit wonky, but you know it serves its purpose and gets us some cash flow, and we're able to pull most of our money out of it. So, yeah, that that was man. Ricardo was a great lead manager when it came to stuff like that, especially mm-hmm. the old ladies. Like he did a really good job. <laughs> like, I know, <laughs> smooth talker, but he was he was good, just really good overall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ricardo was awesome. So he, Ricardo was our. We had a lead manager who's based out of um, Central America. You know, real deep voice, just like little bit of like sexy Latin flavor on the way that he spoke. Yeah. And he used to crush it with those old yeah. ladies, man. He did a great job. He was, he was a sexy dude. He's always flexing on camera. I mean, he was a character. Dude was a character was. for sure. But you know, when he was oh dialed in, he was dialed in. Oh, you know, yeah, when he I wasn't, did. he wasn't. He's like a very typical sales guy. 100% oh, oh, sales guy. All or nothing. But yeah, I know. He, he, he hit it off so well with so many of the elder women, though, the point that it would be like a problem. Because yeah. I'd be like, they would be, people would be calling in just to talk to him. And I'd be like, dude, you got, you got a job too, to do. Yeah. Like, and, and he's like, well, there might be a deal. I'm like, no, man. No. She just wants to pretend that you're her long lost lover. Oh, That's great. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. So, anyways, but yeah, huge first week of, of 2023. I am very pleased. And uh, now, now, now we're just facing the challenge of, transaction coordination and disposition ourselves. So if, uh, if you're in any of our markets and, uh, you 
talk to a seller that says they're under contract with our company, you should probably follow up with them in 30 days right. because we got a lot to figure yeah, out. Exactly. And it's highly yeah. possible that at least one or two of them might not might come not, together. Might not come together. Well, <laughs> for so many reasons, right? There's just so many possible reasons on the seller side too, or a potential buyer side that could fail yeah. have that many. Yeah, exactly. And it is you a know, and, and, nightmare. Yeah. And, and us being a pretty lean shop, you know, we're not typically accustomed to having this many deals in escrow. Uh, well, I guess that's not true. We are. We're not. Ex- we're not accustomed to having this many start at the exact same time. Yeah, because yeah, like if you can stagger the dates, that's fine. Or like you might have a ten in escrow, fifteen in escrow, but one. You know, there might be five of them next month, five this month, mm-hmm. spread across the beginning and end of the month. When well, they all happen at the same time, and you're kind of timing thirty day closings. Yeah, things can happen yeah, pretty fast. Exactly. Yeah, because it's a bunch of different buyers, a bunch of different sellers. You got to negotiate a bunch of different yeah. escrow communications. Yeah, it just gets pretty wild pretty quick. Um, but anyway, man. So I'm excited yeah. though. Good stuff. Um, and then on top of that, we are looking good to finally sell our last scab of 2022. I don't want to speak too early, but we clear the 35R. Right, which is the inspection. So we've gotten past that. I mean, yeah, we got through that. We got through that process, which we knew was going to be easy because I did a great job making sure it was renovated nicely. It was just the roof was in question. <laughs> we knew it was going to happen, though. Yeah, so, yeah, so we're having to give question. some some pretty decent concessions on the roof. Yeah. Which, I mean, to be fair, when we initially bought it, it was hard to know how bad it was. Um, and then also to the previous owners, they did a lot to try and conceal how bad yeah, it was. They were such dirt bags and not that we should, not that we can't expect that from like sellers to hide things. Cause we do, but that was a large house. So anything that you hid was kind of hard to, hard to fix all of yeah. it. Right. Because there's just so much. And generally speaking, I swear though, that the house was in better condition when we walked it from when they moved out. I'm absolutely they no, they things to it. They did some heinous stuff in there, like no doubt about it. Um, I mean, and like I, I think too, what what's easy to happen is we're used to buying such C class properties, doing a lot of you know deals in bad areas, just the nature yeah. of you know the wholesale business. Um, and this is like in like a nice neighborhood, and I think it's yeah. easy to sort of look at the age of the house. Um, you know, the neighborhood that it's in, like the general the exterior and sort of like just, just, you know, even like just basic vibe of the area and overlook things because you're like, oh, this can't be nearly as bad as the crack house that we did a half a mile from here, you know, well, and then can and your neighbors will steal your trampoline. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it does not matter. Still bitter about that, <laughs> man. Well, I, about I, I should well, look up what I reported us to the city like five times to the point where the fire department showed up. I mean, come on. <laughs> and then we're like, by the way, your back doors kicked in. So I was kind of thankful for that. But yeah, yeah, that's funny. We did have but, somebody living there for a while. Yeah, like in, like in the house, mm-hmm. like a homeless person. I told person? you about that, right? Yeah, I told you about that. <laughs> no, yeah, the fire, the fire, the fire, the fire department showed up because like the lady just kept calling and calling and said because the grass was growing and I was like, dude, we're going to cut it. Like, give me a break, you know? And the fire, the fireman showed up and then I was going to try to sell it to him. He's like, Oh, I might be interested in buying this place. I was like, really? This was before we renovated it. So I tried to sell it to him, but he's like, yeah, somebody's definitely been living in here. I was like, damn it. And oh, so man. That's anyhow, fine. I did. yeah, we didn't have a problem. Like they were clean people. They, whoever the homeless person was, I was living. It probably wasn't homeless. It's probably the previous owners coming back just to use a toilet. Honestly, it probably was. Um, no, that that's crazy. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't realize that. Um, we had a but, whole uh, fun time with that property. But yeah, we're almost done. I think hopefully. the close date was like February. It's still a ways out though, so anything anything can happen in that time. I know. Yeah, we still we still a little ways out, and it was like as a VA loan. So there's some weird stuff going on with it. But I think the buyer is pretty motivated at this point to get he it done, is, and it'll just be a matter of getting through that VA appraisal um, mm-hmm. to get that. To get the because our purchase price, we yeah, it's funny because we, we we were in the middle of refinancing because we were just committed to keeping it through this through the rest of the spring and all that. We were refinancing, and we got an appraisal back for the refinance that is less than what we signed the deal for. So we'll see just how much the appraiser um, uses that um, sale price. Yeah, you know, as opposed yeah. to it's not going to be the same appraiser because this will be a VA appraiser, so it'll be a totally different appraiser. But like it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that how that skews it. I mean, we know as well as any that like the appraisers, they're just like the terrible referee of the real estate world, man. Dude, we, I mean, we had that deal. In fact, that Airbnb that I was talking about a minute ago, I remember when we went to cash out refinance 
And the first lender that we went to um, to refinance it, they came back with like, yeah, it's going to be like appraised at 230 because they didn't look at actual like kind properties in the area. They looked at like right. the fixer upper flipper houses that had been selling on the market. And they were like, you know, they, I don't even know if they walked the house. They literally were just yeah. like, no, here's, that, here's, I remember that one. That appraiser was a dork too. And like, was just such a, it was a challenge to get in there God. and do all that stuff with him. He was just kind of a dummy. We, we've had yeah. it before where like appraisers like, well, I just don't see how you can get that value out of it. I'm like, he's like, you You're guys, right. just, you guys just bought that three months ago for this price. It's like, yeah. And look at it now. And who cares what we paid for it at that price? Cause it did not sell on the market. Yeah, you're right. And that, that was the situation that one was because we had bought it for 200 um, or like 195 or whatever it was. And we hadn't done a ton of renovation. So it was pretty much turnkey, just basic stuff. And he was like, I don't understand how, why you think it's worth 300 um, when you bought it for 200. Like, how did you buy it for 200 grand if it's worth $300,000? I'm like, well, we talked to the lady. She was going into foreclosure. She like had all these issues that was going on. And we said, here's what we can buy it for, for it to make sense for us. Mm-hmm. And we did. And he's like, I don't believe you. And so he gave us a 230 appraisal and then I challenged the lender and they were like, no, we're not gonna let you do a reappraisal. So we had to start over with a different lender, another 30, 45 days or the hell it was and got a new appraisal, came back 295, no that's questions. A mess. And that's ridiculous. just how it is. Like we've had both good and bad and I'll say the best appraisers are always the ones that call and say, hey, how did you, like, what do you think? Like, how did you get to that number? Like, I, like, I, you know what I mean? Like, because they got to call you anyways to schedule it usually, right? And so and mm-hmm. like, they'll be like, well, what are you thinking like you're expecting? And yeah, maybe they shouldn't say that. I don't know what their ethical standards are. And like, like there was one that we did on, on the one on 20th, our Airbnb up there. And I can't remember talking to him, but I was like, yeah, I think we need to be above 400 on this thing. And I think we ended up getting it like 450, 460. 450, right? yeah. Yeah, and, and he's like, well, how do you get to that number? He's like, I see you guys only paid 198 for it. And I was like, or 189 for it. And I was like, well, go inside and you'll find out. Like it's top mm-hmm. to bottom. It's nice. And he's like, okay. And we talked about it. Like I didn't give him comps or anything like that. I just told him where I thought we would be. Um, we've definitely have a, I've definitely had appraisers call and I've given them the three comps and they came in, the appraiser came in with those three comps and it was Montgomery when we did that. And that was a very favorable appraisal. Yeah. That's, that was super favorable. That was, that was, I think that might be our biggest deal we've ever done. Yeah. That was because, a deal. yeah, cause we bought that one for, I think we bought that one for what? 195. It appraised for what? 450? 460 or 460. 460. Yeah. We pulled out an insane amount of cash. It was like 160,000. Yeah. yeah we, we, we netted above our rehab cost a hundred grand on the refi. It was like yeah, ninety. It was like ninety six thousand above our rehab cost. That free income right there, yeah. man. That's the power of the the Burr method. Tax free. Um, yeah, it was tax not debt free. Yeah. It was definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely debt free. Yeah, sorry, tax free. Yeah. I got myself. Back. It was that was that was fun. That was cool. When yeah. you when you can cash out more than you have into the property, that's when you like that. That's like the cool burrs. Like yeah, and that's a cool that's a cool story too. Because I remember when we got that appraisal in. Do you remember when we got that appraisal in? Uh, I'm re- or no, I'm trying to. Where were we? Oh, we were, we, were get, we were we were getting toasty in Maui, bro. Was it Maui? <laughs> we were sitting on the beach drinking. Yeah. That was, but that was the appraisal <laughs> yeah. when we got the check. When we we got a mm. check for it, and and we're, I think we were sitting at my house, and we we're like, I, was, I showed my wife, and she was like, eh, whatever. Yeah, like, hundred so grand. Impressed. She's like a hundred grand. I was like, or no, it was one hundred sixty <laughs> grand or whatever. And she's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, whatever. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like the whole process that we went through on this whole thing to get that money. Yeah, you Probably. just didn't bring enough big Dan energy, dude. You got to get her excited. I get, where's my BDE shirt? You get that design? In Madison, yeah, if you go to collectingkeyspodcast.com slash BDE, um, and you can uh, you can find out the status on that shirt. Um, <laughs> I put a little video up there so you can know the true situation about why it's not done from when Dan there's started some, running his There's some corruption going on in that video. I'm sure it's not <laughs> true. It's, there's, we've, got some, we've got some problems. Mike and I are disagreeing on some design on the back end of it. If anyone really wants to see the stuff that Dan came up with, I didn't come up with. I will say this: I did not come up with them. I tried to take what was in my head and give it to a person that was going to do it for twenty bucks in India. Exactly, and and what (laughs) they did is they language barrier. Yeah, the language barrier, and then they went on like some sort of font software and just typed in BDE, and we're like, "Here you go, that'll be twenty dollars, please." Um, But yeah, they're they're terrible. Four thousand purchases on there, though. You think that they would be like legit? And like 4.9 no, stars. Well, no, because here's the thing when it comes to stuff like that in general, most other people also have terrible taste in that. Like how many freaking real estate investment companies have that same fucking logo with like the little roof with the window right, with like the half right, roof on either yeah. side? 
Like there's liter- there is a massive con going on mm-hmm. in India where they just like they go and they just find all of the real estate people and they yes. take that same logo and they just change the color and they just sell it to people for like thirty bucks. And people exactly. are like, Wow, I had zero expectations for someone from a third world country. So this just blew my mind. This blew my mind. It's weird. It looks like all the other competitors logos. <laughs> but they don't but they don't even see it. No, because mine has a square window and theirs is a circle. I'm like, yeah, yeah it's the same fucking thing. It's the same thing. But <laughs> they all look like trash. I, they all I feel like we, we have the original because I think Madison did ours before. Your wife did our logo yeah. originally. Ours has always been tip top. Yeah, it has been. Original it's been, one. It's been super unique. Yeah. Yeah, original one. Yeah, that INW Properties one yeah. is good. Um, and then, uh, I mean, I don't know. I feel like Daniel that's doing our, our new brand that we're building oh, yeah. out. Yeah, which Collecting Keys is great. Yeah, Collecting Keys has been good. Um, but uh, anyway. Back to home buyers. Um, yeah, but... Um, I uh, I wanted to talk about something today though that was a really good topic that came up from our Instant Investor Program actually. So um, our group coaching program, the Instant Investor Program, one of the things that we have started to do this year was basically we have a channel in our Slack group for the community, which is content requests. And people can go and they can request specific stuff that will either turn into group uh, course material for the course that comes with the Instant Investor Program. We'll turn it into a podcast episode, whether it's this one or it is like a one of our um, Friday Focus Shorts. We'll turn it into a YouTube video. We'll turn it into social media content. Whatever kind of makes sense for the question mm-hmm. is it, you know, we're going to turn it into content. So that way the people that have opted to join our community, which you should as well, um, you they get exactly what they want. And it's not just because like one of the things that I hate in all the different groups and stuff that we've been involved in is ultimately I find what it turns into is it's kind of like their way or the highway in the way of right. doing stuff. And right. there's or no get, reason also, that you also get stuck in this thing where they're constantly pumping in new people. So then everything starts to stay the basic, like yeah, for the new people to like, it just stays at the basic level. So you never can really, it's hard to get really that, that deep level of content on certain things or dive deep into specific topics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and in my mind, if you are paying someone for expertise, you're paying to be a part of a group, you should be able to get the questions and stuff that you want answered in like a long form formal format, right? So that's just my opinion on it. But yeah, if you're interested in that, go to collectingkeyspodcast.com and you can click um, become an instant investor at the top and that will give you all the options that we have there. But anyway, so Dylan, who's one of our instant investor members, he had a great discussion topic, which I think is trying to figure out the difference between like appropriate level of ambition and being content and like when exactly is enough enough and why. And I think that's a great question because Dylan like has been crushing it yeah. over this past year. Like he's he made more money this year than he used to make at his salary as a pharmacist. You know, he's doing some huge deals. He just bought like the six seller finance deals, like a 12 unit. Ah, a he's going to make deal. insane money on. And it's funny. He's kind of crossed this threshold now where I remember when I personally kind of got here of like, okay, like we're starting to do well, like better than most people. Mm-hmm. And at what point do you just like say, I'm cool with this? And at what point do you say, I'm going to just like go for it and yeah. see if I can make like, you know, fuck you money at the end of it, right? Um, and I think that that's a very personal question that you kind of have to do some little bit of internal reflection. But I don't know, Dan, like what's your immediate thought when someone asks that sort of question? Yeah, my, my immediate thought thought is yeah it's definitely a personal question and it can probably change over time because mm-hmm. here here and here's some, some context around it too when you're talking about specifically to like our wholesale business you get to this point to where you're like okay so like we're doing pretty good like just us like you know just me mm-hmm. as a solopreneur do i really want to take on the headache of five or six people and what is that going to gain me and is is the is the juice worth the squeeze at that point? So say I'm making, hey, I'm making two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred thousand dollars a year in wholesale fees, and then I'm adding like you know four or five properties to my portfolio every year. Like that's pretty solid. And if you can do that by yourself, a guy might say like, man, I, I'm able to do this in like thirty hours a week. I'm loving it. If but I think I can do a million. Should I go for a million? <laughs> but I got to add all these staff and I'm gonna be working 60 hours a week maybe until you can systematize it to get to that. And then do you go to the next level? And so my immediate thought is all that aside is like, like 
what that can change and that should probably change over time as you're especially as you age you kind of start seeing things differently like for me I, i'm trying to scale super fast because i want to have the options i shouldn't say try to scale super fast because i've been in this game since 2016 and like real estate's been kind of like my like end game like okay this is what i'm going to do but the ways it's become my end game has changed vastly in the last mm -hmm. seven years um but I, I will say like for me my goal would be like okay i want this to be like i want to create enough wealth that like i have options in life and not options to spend money but options of what to do in life options to work like job optional so one could say well if i just did this as a solopreneur for 10 years and i could do this forever it's like yeah, i don't want to do it forever yeah right. i don't want to have yeah, to do it forever i should say rather um you know i want that i want i want the scale to get there and see how big i can go mm -hmm. yeah for sure and, and i think that as you sort of approach this and you know if you start to do well and you try to figure out you know what ambition for being content and stuff looks like for you it's important to sort of do a full life reflection and see what you want your life to look like kind of like dan said you know you want to have options um but i think that having a list of you know, what are like your bucket list items? What do you want your day to day life to look like? Mm. What do you want your vacations to look like? What do you want your house to look like? What do you want your family life to look like? And there's no right or wrong answer with that, right? Because there are people that like literally if they can go and they can make, you know, $6,000 a month in passive income, or they make $150,000 a year, but they can do so in a way where they can go to all their kids basketball games, and they can like do the family trip down to the Snake River every year or whatever. And that's what makes them happy, then freaking shoot for that. Like, yeah. I think one of the things that becomes very toxic for people is there are people who are inclined to do that, but they feel like they need to be heavily pursuing the hustle culture and trying to, you know, make like big money and do all these things when it's not actually their personality. Right. Um, and I will say, like, vice versa, you know, there's a lot of people who, um, you know, want to do bigger things. And if they just only get to that $6,000 a month in passive income and their $1,500, uh, sorry, $150,000 a year in revenue from their business, like that's going to feel like a, you know, missed opportunity to them. Um, and like, like I said, I think that does change over time. Cause I will say that most people, this is, this is the most common why I hear from investors when they inquire about our group coaching program, or they, um, you know, even just talk to people, this day to day, everyone says, if I could make $5,000 a month, my life would look completely different, right? For some reason, that $5,000 is like a very round number. I think a lot of people, um, if they live a modest lifestyle, that sort of would cover their their monthly expenses, right? In a lot of markets. Um, and so that's like what they shoot for. And I mean, I, yeah, that was even my goal when I first started, or when 5, I moved 000. into my, yeah, $5,000 a month. Mine was 10. Mine was ten thousand back in. 20, yeah, but but you are you already had like the big house and like you were your freaking borderline C suite at your job. You know you're making like I wasn't, dude. I was a bum. I was homeless. Not you're really. Like, man, <laughs> if I could if I could make eight hundred dollars a month. Yeah, yeah, no, no, dude. I well, I mean, I, like my wife and I, we lived a super simple lifestyle. So when you I quit guys, my W two, you guys live pretty lean most of the time anyways yeah so yeah so when, when i left my w2 and i quit my engineering job you know we pulled back our expenses and we lived a very solid life on my wife's income which after taxes was like forty one hundred dollars a month and we like we did that just fine and we enjoyed it so like my view was if i can get to five grand a month we'll be able to do yeah. that and i will have the freedom to go and make more money somewhere else right or like to do whatever i want um but then the crazy thing that happens is you start to pursue different, you know, business ventures, you start to buy assets, all of a sudden $5,000 a month can come very quickly, whether it's passive or active, yeah. you know, and like the eye opening thing to me was when we started the, you know, the wholesale business where getting traction, all of a sudden we had a month where we made $50,000. <laughs> and I was like, shit, that's like way more than 5,000. That's like 5,000 for 10 months, you know? Right. And then two months after that, we made $100,000. And that completely spun my goals and expectations and like my view of content versus ambition on its head. Yeah. Like literally overnight that happened. Yeah. Dude, yeah, you get like, to see I, what's possible. Yeah. yeah. I remember when that that deal in October of that year closed with that um, that lady that was like on drugs that like ghost us and we had to like JV it oh, yeah, and all that yeah, sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Um, when that deal closed, it was on my birthday um, in October of 2020. 
And that pushed us over $100,000 for the month. And I literally, because we had a deal closed the day before, we had that deal closed. And I was up in Sandpoint with my parents for my 30th birthday. And I remember sitting there thinking like, no one else realizes this right now, but my life literally just changed. Like 100%. You're like, I'm an old piece of shit now. That's what you thought. (laughs) No, I was like, my views on finance and success literally just changed forever this afternoon. And like, I couldn't explain that to anyone because it's like a weird thing. Thing, you know, yeah, it's hard to um, yeah, exactly. It's hard to explain, but that. but like that is like a pinnacle point in my life that I will always remember that mm-hmm. that evening, that afternoon, because my views on what I was going to be content with changed forever. Yeah, um, and you know, from that standpoint, I like from from that point on, I made the decision that I want to do bigger things. I want to have right. a larger income. I want to have a larger lifestyle. And that's what, you know, got me, you know, what took us into scaling very heavily in 2021, got me into joining Go Abundance, where I'm around people that are trying to do bigger stuff, got you and me talking a lot more openly about finances and the different things that we were going to be pursuing. Um, and, you know, that was like the personal adaptation that I had at that point. But, but I don't think they um, have to be mutually exclusive, right? Like we interviewed, no. which I don't know when that episode is going to drop versus this, but we interviewed Drew Wired, um, investor from Fort Wayne. And he mm-hmm. made a great comment that he said, I have what most investors don't have, and that's enough. He's mm-hmm. content. Oh. He's content. But dude is still out there slinging deals. He's still buying things, and he's still like driving himself to do better. But he's like, at the end of the day, he's content with what he has. He doesn't need a lot. But unfortunately, um, for the people that think, you know, if you're focused on money, unfortunately for them, that's how you, that's how you keep scoring this game is the mm-hmm. dollars and cents. I love the concept of, of uh, die with zero or, you know, like from that book, like I like that idea because really at the end of the day, like you should live a full life. And if that takes you spending money to do that, do it because you can't live your life after you're gone and nobody can live your life for you. So like you should keep score with the dollars and cents and try to fulfill your life until you're content. If you have a problem with being content because you're ambitious, which is where I think like a person like Dylan can come in because he's obviously ambitious and he's obviously kicking ass. You definitely have to balance that. You And you have to, I have to do it. I have to find balance because otherwise you can leave those around you like kind of in the dust. You cannot have relationships. Mm-hmm. You could burn relationships or just let relationships die because all you're doing is, is going after like whatever you're ambitious about, like whatever you're focused on. And, and again, that may appear to be just the dollars and cents, but it's actually probably dollars and cents all in, in, in parallel with the success of doing things well and doing them, you know, really well. Yeah. I think that's very, very well stated. And yeah, that, that comment from Drew, um, I don't know. What do you think? Is that, is that like the best quote that we've had from any guests on this show? It might be up there, I think man. it's the most genuine quote. Most Honestly. genuine quote. It's so good. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it, I think you know, what you said there is absolutely right. And one of the ways that I've heard to sort of view it as well, which I really liked, um, I think it was from Brandon Turner from, um, you know, X bigger pockets host. And he said that there's basically three levels to wealth that he's discovered. And cause like when you start to get going in business, start to buy assets, like general financial freedom can come relatively easily. Like honestly, um, you know, like 100% pass financially free for the rest of your life is a myth. That's not a real thing that happens. You're always going to kind of have to do something unless you get like legit big, big money, you know, even like, even if you, even if you get like a $10 million windfall and you're like in your thirties, realistically, you're going to use that by the time you're old, unless you just live like a super frugal life. Right. Um, if you don't like invest, you don't do anything, but you know, you start a business, you can start generate a decent amount of wealth relatively quickly. But his, he said, there's three stages of wealth and you just kind of have to find which one fits your I guess like mission objective in life and your lifestyle. So you say the first phase of wealth is, you know, you can kind of buy whatever you want. You know, you can, you don't have to like worry about budgets. You can take the vacations, you know, your kids can go to private school. You can buy the nice house. You can have the nice cars. You can do all that sort of stuff. That's like level one. Okay. Level two is basically you can do all of those things, but you can, um, you know, do like the next level up version. So like maybe you can like fly private, right? Or you can like, you like exclusively fly fly first class and stay in five-star resorts. You can bring your extended family with you. 
you know, like like the Home Alone dad who takes the whole freaking <laughs> family to balling, Paris. <laughs> he was balling, right? But that's like the second level of wealth, right? And you now have a total influence on your social group and your family and all that sort of stuff, right? Your wealth can affect those without it necessarily affecting you in a negative way. And then the third level of wealth um, is you have enough wealth that you can do things that benefit and affect communities, right? Mm, so this great. is like where you can start foundations, you know, you can start like philanthropic companies, you can do all these sort of things that you now have the freedom to make that your focus. And not only do you have the freedom to make that your focus, but you have the financial ability to, you know, make that effective, right? And you're not trying to like bootstrap an orphanage, which is going to lead to a really difficult life for you, but you can actually do like philanthropic philanthropic capitalism where you're taking the money you have earned and you're using it to do good things. And that is like the third level of wealth. And I would say the fourth level of wealth, which you didn't talk to because this is out there for most people, is where you're able to do that, but you're able to influence like countries, <laughs> right? When you get to people politics. that ge geopolitical politics, but yeah. that's like reserved for like the billionaires. And usually that's where it starts to get a little bit evil too. So yeah. we'll, we'll ignore you gotta that be one. Careful. You got to be careful there. Yeah. No, that's a yeah, great but, perspective. And I think a lot of people would want to do the number three. Um, mm -hmm. But boy, that's challenging. Um, it a lot is. of people aren't willing to, wouldn't be willing to sacrifice to get to either one, two or three and could potentially, you know, look negatively upon the ambitious person, which, which sometimes will help would pull people back from being ambitious and make them mm -hmm. force them to be a little bit more content, especially if it's people they respect around them, asking them to pull back. So I think if you're ambitious, you should always focus that effort because you could be ambitious in a lot of different ways, bad ways included. But being health, being ambitious and being healthy about it is is a key to success in life, regardless of yeah. however you're keeping score, mm -hmm. dollars and cents yeah. or not. Yeah, and I think what you said there too about being healthy about it is kind of the key role, right? Like regardless of what you do, you know, whatever your view of being ambitious or being content with what you have, um, like whatever that looks like, ultimately you have to do it from a standpoint where you are working on yourself regardless, and you are doing things that ultimately make you happy and give you some level of, you know, satisfaction, because otherwise, you're going to be a miserable prick. And the thing is, more money isn't going to make that better. More freedom isn't necessarily going to make that better. You know, if you have more freedom, you're going to get bored. If you have more money, you're going to work harder, or you're still going to be upset because a lot of your life circumstances aren't going to change. And so like, when you're looking at it, ultimately doing so in a healthy way where you have that balance is going to be super, super important. What would, you, what would you say to this though? Like, so there's kind of this idea that, um, you hear some people say like, well, um, if they don't believe in you or they're a hater or whatever, just leave them behind. You don't need those relationships because they're dragging you down. Like, is there a balance? Because then the other thing we, you and I talk about is like always associate yourself with people that you want to be like, or people that are doing things you want to do. Right. So mm -hmm. potentially you're like leaving, some of these existing relationships that might be important relationships to, relationships to you behind. How do you balance that where you have highly ambitious friends and network of people you hang out with, with other people in your life that are not ambitious and just are content? Do you still keep them in your circle or would you say you kind of cut them out? Um, so I, I will say what's happened in my personal life. Um, I mean, so first off, I've, I've usually been that ambitious friend in pretty much every friend group that I've ever had. Um, and I will say, I, I didn't cut people out. They just kind of fell off. What you about know, we just anybody didn't. that you would care about or relationships that you'd want to maintain? Like being like super specific. Cause it's like easy to say, it's like, I'm like, yeah, you don't have to tell me like, yeah, me and my dad, we hate each other now. Um, no. <laughs> That's but like, not true. No, I know that. But like, you know, of course there's friends that maybe you were in high school with or college with, or that you had met that you just weren't like quality friends. I guess I'm talking about people that you genuinely, um, have at a point in time had really strong relationships. This could be family. This could be extended family, cousins and people like that, or somebody that, but people that just didn't have the same ambition as you or the same, um, goals as you and because of that you just had to stop being around them gotcha. it'd be like it'd so, be like if i just like if i was just like no nah, i'm good dude see you later i'm just gonna kind of do my thing and chill and yeah not work and be ambitious yeah so i'll say yeah, like i said they, they kind of organically fell off um for the most part the the people that weren't super aligned with that and i guess like i'll say that if people that are in different situations if you're looking at that if they are toxic to you and they are like dragging you backwards, then you should probably cut them off. But Absolutely. if they're just not mutually aligned, 
here's what I'll say is don't be that asshole that tries to like force people to be aligned with you. Like if they want to just be do their thing, leave yeah. them alone. They don't yeah. need to be content. Like yeah. if they're if they're like completely neutral to you, they're not necessarily supporting you or they're not dragging you down, fucking let them live their life. Who cares? Yeah, I, here's why I asked that question because I, I know some very successful people, very like, you know, wildly successful that still like have great strong relationships with people mm-hmm. that are not in their new friend circle. They don't get to go yeah. to the country club because, you know, that's just not where they're at, but they still have strong relationships with them. And I think you you should value that and totally. still maintain those relationships and not just try to, do what some people say was just cut everybody out of your life go over here because that's where you want to be because i still think i think you're losing part of life and i think that's part of being healthy when you talk about being ambitious and and for me a big thing in the back of my head is like how do you maintain and work on those relationships around you while you're being ambitious Mm -hmm. yeah i I think that that i mean that is valid point and it i think that maintaining those relationships like that again as long as they're not toxic does keep you grounded for sure. Especially if you knew them through like your rise up, like your yeah. rise up to success and they're still in like the same spot, that should always be a reminder kind of of where you came from and it should also be a mutual level of respect. And I will say even though that I've had, you know, more financial success than uh, as far as I know all of like my college friends, tell you what, like when we hang out because they are all legitimately good friends, they're not toxic towards me at all, they're not toxic towards each other. They don't give a shit. And we still have just yeah. as much fun going to a crappy still, dive bar in San Diego. Like degenerates. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. You no, know, like so, and, awesome. but I will say like the, the counter to your point, like the people that look at those relationships, they're like, nah, I don't hang out with them anymore. They just like the party or whatever. It's like, just do it in moderation. Like you don't need to be a dick to your friends just because they don't have the same ambitions to you and write them right. off. Cause they might still want to be your friend. I think that's fine. But anyway, so that yeah, we got into whole different we wormhole so there but deep there. <laughs> anyway when it comes down to monitoring your ambition versus deciding when to be content i think like the main tip i would get is you know write down your ideal life once you want your days to look like your work life to look like your vacations to look like your family to look like all that sort of stuff and then reverse engineer what that's going to take like in terms of costs associated to live that lifestyle and then decide if you know, you can kind of be content with your goals or if you do want to be more ambitious. And then also too, as you are working on growing yourself, be willing to evolve and adapt and change that and realize that life is always a moving target. You're never going to just like reach a point where you're like, yep, I think I'm done. I have, you know, the rest of my life to live and I'm just not going to do anything anymore. And if you do do stuff like, if you do reach that point, then yeah, we can't be friends. I do have to cut you out because like people always have to have something that they're going towards. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm like, what are you doing? Man? Yeah, you gotta you gotta have something. <laughs> and I I would just I would only add to what you're saying. There is like as you chart your goals, as you chart where you want to be, what ideal what your ideal life is, and as you said, working backwards, what are you willing to sacrifice? And what are you not willing to sacrifice in that process? Yes. I think that's massive. Exactly. Yeah, that, and that's a whole other conversation too because you need to have that balance. Um, awesome guys. Hopefully, I didn't get too meta for all of you, but. Dylan, thanks so much for that question, man. I think that that is a super good topic and is extremely relevant for people like such as many of the members in our instant investor program, our group coaching program, who start to have success, right? And you start to realize, like, what do I want this to look like? So do this exercise. Um, It's very, very important. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this show, please share with anybody who might find it interesting or entertaining. Also, if you go and you leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast and you send me a DM, I will send you a free collecting keys t-shirt. Send me a DM at Mike underscore invest. I'll send you a free collecting keys shirt. I actually am on the way, on my way to the post office afternoon to send out three Ooh. free shirts for awesome. people that left us, left us a five-star review and sent me a DM. So definitely do that. I'm going to be happy to get you a shirt. On top of that, guys, if you want to start finding off-market properties, you can also sign 10 deals in three days like we just did. Go to collectingkeyspodcast.com slash free, and you can get your free five-step guide to start generating off-market leads, and that will at least give you the base. And then if you really want to um, start signing deals, go to collectingkeyspodcast.com and look at our seven-figure investor programs if you'd be a good fit. Anyways, guys, thanks so much for listening, and talk to you all next week. See you. Thanks for listening. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And check us out at collectingkeyspodcast.com for tips and guides on starting your own real estate investment and wholesaling business.